Welcome to the Evaluation and Management Services webcast series for Palmetto GBA Jurisdiction J11 and Railroad Medicare. My name is Carrie Weiss and I am a Senior Provider Education Consultant in the Provider Outreach and Education Department. Joining me today are several colleagues from the J11 and Railroad Medicare Provider Outreach and Education Department. Before I get started, I'd like to take a minute to share a few housekeeping items related to the ON24 webcast platform. A copy of today's PowerPoint is available through the resource widget. From the resource widget, you may print the slides if you choose. You control the volume of today's webcast. The sound quality is determined by the computer speakers and or headset. Please take a moment to adjust the sound volume if necessary. I will ask that you hold your questions until the end of the presentation. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the webcast where I will address questions related to today's presentation. Holding your questions until the end allows you to focus on the material currently being presented and will allow me to read the submitted questions out loud so that everyone can hear the question and answer. Reminder, there will be additional webcasts discussing the key components um, which have been completed but are recorded now. A certificate of attendance is also provided under the resource widget. You may print the certificate as proof of attendance. I will provide a Palmetto GBA course number at the end of the session. Palmetto GBA does not offer CEUs, however, many associations and organizations may accept a copy of the PowerPoint and certificate of attendance for full or partial credit towards satisfying their CEU requirements. So a reminder, the Palmetto GBA course number is not an index number. For those of you that are affiliated with the AAPC, they do not require an index number for webcasts that are presented by a Medicare Administrative Contractor or MAC. Lastly, at the end of the presentation, we will ask you to complete a short survey to assist with evaluating improving and improving future educational events. As I mentioned earlier, you can accept, access the, and print the PowerPoint and certificate. These items are available under the resource widget. Widgets are similar to portals that allow you to access different areas of the ON24 platform. The list of available widgets is listed at the bottom of your screen. Once the resource widget is open, you may use the maximize and minimize bars located on the top right corner of the resource list to expand or shrink that information. Now don't worry if you accidentally close a widget, you can easily go back and reopen it the same way you initially did by clicking on the desired widget at the bottom of the screen. As a reminder, the information provided in this presentation was current as of February 19, 2014. Updates to the material in this presentation subsequent to February 19th will be provided through normal communication channels, which include the Palmetto GBA Jurisdiction J11 and Railroad Medicare websites and their listserv message process. Note the CPT codes and descriptions are copyright of the 2013 American Medical Association, all rights reserved. CPT is a registered trademark of the American Medical Association, AMA. The Evaluation Management Ser um, Services webcast series was comprised of four parts. During today's webcast, we will discuss part four. As I mentioned earlier, the previous uh, parts, so part one through three, were recorded and are available for playback. They are located under the Learning and Education tab, which is on the left-hand side of the J11 homepage under Self-Paced Learning. Once you enter Self-Paced Learning, you will select Webcast Library, and that would be the same for your Railroad Medicare. As I begin with the fourth part of our evaluation and management webcast series, I want to remind everyone attending this live event or who will be listening to the recorded event, which will later be posted to our Palmetto GBA website, that this session is intended for those providers that submit Part B claims to Jurisdiction J11, which is comprised of West Virginia, Virginia, North and South Carolina, and Railroad Medicare. While much of the information represents national information, some material may be specific to Palmetto GBA. With that being said, let's get started with part four. The agenda for part four 
which is our E&M Services Medical Decision Making, we will discuss the medical decision making component that is comprised of three areas, of uh, three topics, diagno diagnosis management options, type of data, and the risk assessment. We'll also discuss common E&M documentation coding errors and tips for preventing E&M and documentation coding errors. And as always, I will conclude today's webcast with resources to assist you um, after this session. Now, as I just mentioned, there are three areas um, of the medical decision-making component, and those are diagnosis management options. So that's anything that's being addressed or managed um, during that encounter. The type of data, so that is anything that has been reviewed or ordered, such as diagnostic tests, um, laboratory tests, um, and some additional information, which I'll share with you um, here in the future. Um, and the last part is the risk assessment, and that's basically the risk that's involved with that patient um, from that encounter into the next encounter. And CMS has developed a chart um, that defines or provides you with kind of a guidance, and it's called the table of risk. Now, please keep in mind the medical decision-making correlates with um, the A and P portion of a SOAP note, so your assessment and plan. And if you think about it, and I've mentioned this before in our first webcast um, under the general documentation requirements, um, medical decision making basically kind of steers medical necessity. And in other words, anybody can document a history and examination to the fullest extent. Um, and we do find that. We find that with um, EMRs or cloning um, where things are brought forward, or it could be just a matter of um, additional information that was not relevant to that encounter or to those problems or diagnoses. Um, but if you look at that medical decision-making component, it kind of is what it is. Um, you know, it's how that patient presents its tests that are medically necessary, et cetera. It's captioning, captioning um, or capturing that physician or NPP's work. Um, so again, anybody can document an examination and a history component to the highest level, to a comprehensive. Um, so uh, generally, you kind of take that medical decision making and it steers medical necessity. Now, don't get me wrong, there are times when a history and examination um, may need to be at a comprehensive level. So that patient requires a comprehensive history and a comprehensive examination, but let's say they only have moderate um, medical decision making. Um, you still look at that overall picture. And that's why it can be difficult with EMRs and any tools that are used because, you know, a lot of these are point driven. Um, so they are using these point systems. And yes, a computer and um, a tool can count those points. However, um, you still need that human interaction to kind of say, is this correct? Is this medically necessary or reasonable and necessary? Um, so you can't solely rely on just a tool or an EMR. You have to still use that kind of human interaction to determine if indeed it is still medically necessary. Um, so proceeding with the medical decision-making component, what we've done at Palmetto GBA and a lot of other entities have done this is they w had to quantify or they needed to quantify the medical decision-making component. Because if you read the guidelines, they simply state, you know, the complexity could be straightforward, low, moderate, or high, and then they give verbiage like minimal, limited, multiple, extensive, and it, there's no really definition for those. And so, again, you capture it by using a point system or quantifying that. And, um, you know, it's not... Um, you know, it's not a perfect system, but it's a system to help you determine your medical decision making. Um, and, and so therefore, and it also helps with consistency, um, consistency within Palmetto GBA or consistency with coders, um, because they're using something to quantify um, that this area. And so if you look at this chart that's in front of you, this is just a snapshot of the three areas. So um, your diagnosis management options, your type of data, and your overall risk. 
and then the complexity that's associated with it. Now, CMS provides us with um, how you determine um, the medical decision making. So you'll see above it says to qualify for a given type of medical decision making, two of the three elements must be either met or exceeded. Um, so we'll talk about that here in a minute because I'm going to give you an example to help you really kind of put that into perspective. So let's break down each of these sections of medical decision making, these areas. The first one we will talk about is the diagnosis management options. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this is things that are associated typically with your A portion of your note if you keep it in a SOAP format. And it is what has been addressed in that documentation, what you are managing. It's not just a list of diagnoses. Um, so it's not history of, of et cetera. Those would be um, actual uh, past history. So it would go under that history component. It'd be things that you're actually addressing or managing. Um, so you will see here, this is an actual chart that you will find on our audit tool. And you'll notice it's very comparable to other audit tools that are out and about um, used by different entities. And basically you have your problem categories, your number, so whatever, how many ever have been addressed um, or being managed, and then the points, which you multiply times, and then you get your score. Now, our audit tool will do all the work for you, so it's just going to ask you to go through the documentation, look at your assessment, and extract that information. So it's going to look at self-limited or minor, stable, improving, or worsening. We don't tend to use that area that often. If you want some guidance for that type of problem, if you go to your table of risk that is um, pr provided by CMS, they give you some examples of self-limited or minor problems, like a cold, um, an insect bite, et cetera. So those are located, that's kind of a guidance. And that doesn't matter, it doesn't matter for self-limited or minor or stable if it's improving or worsening. And the maximum number, so the maximum you can have is two. So if you have three, you're still only going to get credit for two. Um, the next one is established diagnosis problem stable or improved. And again, it's how many ever that has been addressed um, or you're managing, um, and then you would multiply that by one point. Um, established diagnosis problem worsening is um, points that are allotted are two. And then new problem, no additional workup plan is worth three points, and you'll notice here there's a max here, one. So again, if you only have one, um, you will, will only get credit for one. We will not manipulate that. In other words, we will not say, well, then it's an established problem. If indeed there's more than one new problem with no additional workup problem, unfortunately, in this situation, you only get one point. Um, new problem, additional workup planned or consultation requested, that is worth four. Now, this is where it's kind of important here to explain to you uh, that definition of new problem. Um, what is a new problem? A new problem in Palmetto GBA's eyes is it's new to the provider, not the patient, but the provider. Um, with exception, it could be, um, you know, if you're covering for another physician, um, so you're on call, obviously that, you know, that wouldn't be the same situation. So you wouldn't. Um, and, and I have a slide for this. I'm actually kind of jumping ahead. But um, a new problem is one that's new to the, the uh, provider. And then the also the other definition that people want to know is, well, what's additional workup? What's it involved and can it be done at that encounter, et cetera? Well, we consider um, additional workup things like uh, diagnostic laboratory tests, it could even be that you are um, requesting a um, colonoscopy where you need those results back, um, a biopsy that you need that information back. So that can be further workup. Um, obviously, consultation is whenever you request a consultation from um, someone else, a specialty, et cetera. Um, the key here, though, is additional workup can be done at that encounter and still be given credit. So we look at it as you're still requesting additional workup. You still may have asked for those labs at that time, but you're still going to get credit. And not only that, even if you get the results back. So think about in the emergency department situation setting. Um, they, 
they're basically the majority of the time, 99% of the time probably, are dealing with new problems with additional workup. Now, speaking of in the emergency department, times when we see that it isn't a new problem is when it's clearly documented that maybe that patient had been in the day, day prior, that same physician had maybe had an encounter with them, and so they, you can clearly see that in the documentation. But typically in the ED setting, emergency department setting, ER, it is a new problem, and usually they're doing additional workup. Now, um, just some things, some FAQs or some reminders about uh, the diagnosis management options. Um, number one is it may be explicitly stated or implied um, in the documented decisions regarding management plans or further evaluation. Um, the key here is really you need to be concise. When you get down to your assessment, try to be as concise as possible with your diagnosis. It's going to help your coders. Um, and then not only that, use terminology like the next bullet. Is it improved? Is it worsening? Because if we can't tell, and our clinicians are going to look at the overall documentation, they're going to try to decipher and determine, is this worsening? Is this better? But there's times you cannot tell. So therefore, it's in your best interest to be very specific or very concise to explain that it is improved, it is worsening. Um, and then the last one is presenting problems without an established diagnosis. The assessment or clinical impression may be stated as possible, probable, or rule out. Now, a lot of you may be cringing, and I'm not talking about the billing. I'm not talking about coding rule outs. I'm not talking about coding possibility. You are coding, obviously, based on your signs and symptoms. But what this does, if you use that terminology within your assessment slash plan area, you can then let us into it, let somebody, not only to an auditor, but a coder, into your thought process on what you think that is occurring. Um, I'll, take, I'll share an example. Um, somebody who presents to you with chest pain. Well, chest pain could be maybe GERD. Well, chest pain GERD is not going to be the same risk that's involved with chest pain and MI or an anxiety attack. So, it's important to make sure that it's very clear. And again, it's letting us into that provider's thought process so that we're able to give the appropriate credit um, that's warranted. So yes, it's, it's important to document then um, the possible, probable, or, um, and bear with me, I don't know why, but somehow my slides started moving. Um, possible, probable, or rule out. Um, just again, please keep in mind, don't code based on possible, probable, or rule out. Providers should also document, as I mentioned, under the new problem with additional workup or consultation requested, they should be documenting any initiation or changes in treatment and referrals to referrals, consultation, or advice requested. Now, I know you're all familiar with we don't recognize the consultation codes where we used to, re you know, require that request, et cetera, the three R's. Um, but you should indicate, um, in good documentation, you would indicate to whom and where, um, you know, those consultations were requested. And as I mentioned previously, um, new problem, you know, is one that's new to the provider. And I, I mentioned two, or I started out mentioning one situation where it wouldn't be a new, and that would be on call. But I also um, want to mention that the, the initial visit of an established beneficiary in a single specialty practice setting um, with a new provider would not be a new problem. And I, I did provide you with that definition for additional workup and that we do consider that um, it may be performed at the time of the visit, even if you receive the results back at that visit. So let's move on to the second area of medical decision making, which would be the type of data. And um, basically, you're going to see your point system off to the left and your type of data off to the right. Again, our audit tool is going to do all the work for you, as in you're going to explain or you're going to check off whatever has been addressed. Um, so the first one is review and order clinical labs, lab tests. Um, you don't get two points for reviewing and ordering it on the same date. But let's say 
you order it today, so you would get one point, and let's say in three weeks the patient comes back and you discuss the lab results or you review them, um, you would get a point at that time. But you would not get two on the same date. Um, review and order tests in the CPT 70,000 series. So again, you would um, only get the one point for reviewing or ordering on that day. Even if there's multiple tests, it doesn't matter either. So um, if you're multiple 70,000 or multiple labs or multiple 90, you only get one point. And then um, with the 70,000 series, that's things like EK, uh, excuse me, x-rays. So you'd go to your CPT code book, and those would be uh, tests that were related to the 70,000. Then you have your 90,000 series. That's like EKGs, echoes. Um, again, you go to your CPT code book. One, one of them that people don't realize is that an O2 SAT is technically a 90,000 series. Um, it's not a vital sign in Medicare's eyes. So O2 SATs would be one point here under the 90,000. Now, keep in mind, it has to be medically necessary. In other words, it would, be, it would have warranted an O2, uh, F, um, an O2 SAT. It wasn't just um, every patient gets an O2 SAT whether, when they walk in the door. That isn't appropriate. So, and I'm not talking about billing. I'm only talking about that you did review that um, data and you documented that, that and you felt it was appropriate, so credit would be given. Discuss test results with performing physician. Um, we would need to see some documentation to indicate that, yes, indeed, you did discuss something. What did you discuss? A little blurb um, and who you discussed that with. Um, the next one, independent review of image tracing or specimen. This is a very, very important one, and we see a lot of issues with. This is worth two points, and we know this occurs all the time. So basically what that is is, you know, you're independently. You're not the one that is um, actually going to bill for that professional co component. If that's the situation, credit wouldn't be given here. But if you are independently reviewing that image tracing or specimen and you document clearly document that you independently reviewed it. If we can't tell that you independently, it's going to look like you actually looked at a report. So use verbiage like I independently or I personally reviewed and whatever that may be and give a little blurb of what you found. Um, but going back to that professional component, if indeed you're billing for that professional component, you would not receive credit for the independent review of image tracing or specimen. Um, you could get that for uh, ordering it, so up above, and also, a lot of people don't realize, we'll give credit for, let's just say, um, I'll give this, you're an ortho, and at that encounter, you order an, an x-ray um, of the, the sh left shoulder, and then, um, not only that, you um, independently review, review the image tracing or specimen, um, and you're not billing the professional component, then you would receive credit for the 70,000 series, and an independent review of image tracing or specimen. But again, you need to be very clear and concise if you independently review that. The next um, type of data would be the decision to obtain old records and or history from others. Um, simply making a statement so that somebody could identify that you did indeed um, need to reach out or going to reach out um, or reaching out to a certain you know, um, family member, et cetera, or obtain old records. Like, and nowadays, I think with the EMRs, it's really changed things. It's really not the same because everything's kind of right there at your fingertips. Um, a lot of times we, we would see this with um, the, the paper medical records where you would have to request that to the floor, et cetera. And then the last one is review and summarize. So the key here is not only review it, but to summarize it, so you'll summarize those old records and or history obtained from others. Um, so there's two parts to that, and usually what we see in the documentation is you, you, the provider will state they reviewed it and sometimes even include all that documentation, which we don't need, um, but they fail to then summarize. So give some bullets of what was um, addressed or, excuse me, what was reviewed and and um, your feed, your thoughts on that. 
Um, sometimes we see this under the history component, and it can be very confusing. In other words, we can't use information, we can't double dip. So if you're counting on that information as part of your HPI, then we can't use that under this review and summarize old records or history obtained from others. So sometimes it's very, it's in your benefit to keep that review and summarize old records or history obtained from others down under that kind of assessment and plan to make sure that you're keeping it um, where somebody can identify that. Because sometimes what, again, occurs is there's very little HPI, and I'm not sure if maybe the, the provider that's part of their HPI, and therefore, you know, we can, again, only use that once. Um, so be very careful with that. Just a slide that I'd like to throw in here um, is regarding ordering laboratory and diagnostic tests. This includes like PATH, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, right now in this, the, the whole United States, so this country, there is an issue with um, documentation to support the intent of these, these services. Um, CMS, so Medicare requires that not only do uh, the laboratories and um, radiologists, et cetera, even cardiologists, they need to show proof, number one, they rendered the service. So they have to show their, their results, whether that be a lab, an EKG, um, some kind of uh, report for a film, et cetera. They have to provide that, but they also have to provide the intent, which is either um, a signed order or a signed requisition or some type of progress note that's signed by the ordering provider indicating that this was indeed um, ordered. And the issues that we find is that the requisition and order isn't signed. Um, so therefore, the only recourse is to go back to the physician or the NPP and ask for a medical record, so a progress note, to provide proof that yes, indeed, it was ordered, um, because again, they're looking for a signed um, and sometimes it's not even documented in the progress note. Um, so the key here is a good, a good resolution to that would be um, is to sign the requisitions. And it can't be signed by office staff. It has to be signed by the actual ordering physician or NPP. So sign that requisition. Make sure you're signing your orders. Um, and make sure that you include the information in your progress note or sign, and, and sign that progress note. Now, if you feel you have an illegible signature, you're also going to need to provide a signature attestation. Um, now, what occurs is they're going to ask for this documentation from the laboratory or the, the diagnostic individual, so whoever's doing the report. Um, so they may be reaching out to you and asking for that additional information. So don't be surprised. That's why if you can be proactive, then you may not be receiving any of those phone calls. Now, for laboratories, it's a little different. We are required to contact uh, not only the laboratory but the ordering provider. So it's a little different than diagnostics. And I know we kind of went off the beaten path here, but this is just very important because it's a huge problem right now in the nation. Um, CMS wants to know how um, not only are the contractors, but are the, how are the providers going to address this. So even though you may not worry about getting paid for those services, somebody else is and they're relying on your documentation. Um, and it really is a team effort. And they will, they will need to contact you for that additional information. Some frequently asked questions for the type of data, and a lot of this I, I kind of went over or um, expounded upon as we were going through the chart, um, but we'll break down some of these. The laboratory pathology diagnostic tests, um, you can say things like WBCs, elevators, or chest x-ray, unremarkable, that would be acceptable. You could also initial and date the report containing the test results, but you can't just simply state labs reviewed. Um, that's not going to explain to us um, or provide us with more details. Um, we talked about results of the discussion of laboratory radiology, et cetera, those types of tests. If you discuss that with the performing physician, please make sure that you clearly document that. And then, again, we really hit hard on the independently review of image tracing your specimen. 
I can't tell you how many times we look at documentation and we cannot give that credit. And we, it, it can, and I've seen it many times, affect that complexity of medical decision making, which was teetering either to be a moderate or high based on that element or that, that specific bullet. And then um, relevant findings from the review of old records, um, et cetera, should be documented. You can't just simply state old records reviewed or additional history obtained from the family without elaboration. Be specific, be concise, use some bullets. Um, it doesn't have to be a book, but provide us with some additional information. Now, I know this is very difficult for you to see. Um, so this is basically a snapshot of the table risk. Hopefully everybody's familiar with this. I keep one right at my desk. Um, so you can go out to either our website or CMS's website. You can obtain this from the E&M guidelines. Um, basically, if you go to the E&M guidelines that are out under uh, the CMS website, it's page 20. So page 20 of the booklet. And basically, again, they, they've captured or kind of give some guidance here for the table of risk. Um, I want to remind everybody that, um, excuse me, I'm going to go back to that slide. Remind everybody that it is the risk that's involved from that encounter from the next to the next. So it really is that final impression. And so it's just very important to keep that in mind when um, you're looking at this area because there are three areas of risk. There, the first area is the presenting problem. Well, that's kind of deceiving because when you hear presenting problem, you think, okay, how they presented. But it actually is kind of that final impression and, again, from that encounter to the next. Um, your diagnostic procedures ordered, um, it can be anything included um, at that encounter or moving forward. Um, management options selected. Um, keep in mind um, things like um, prescription drugs, et cetera, there, don't need to, there doesn't have to be any changes. Mm -hmm. um, as long as we can see that you did review that um, or you make a notation that you're managing those prescription drugs. So let me kind of break this down even further. So you've got your three areas and then you've got the level of risk, which is either minimal, so that's off to your left, your minimal, low, moderate, or high. Whichever is the highest, so it, it, between the presenting problem, diagnostic procedures, and management options, whichever, whichever is the highest of those three areas is the risk that's involved with your patient. And let's tackle that first column, so your presenting problem. I'll dive right in to make the moderate category. So think about your Medicare population. A lot of the providers, I'm sure on this call, are dealing with multiple comorbidities. Um, they tend to fall into this moderate category because the first bullet under moderate is one or more chronic illnesses with mild exacerbation, pro progression, or side effects of treatment. The second one, though, two or more stable chronic illnesses. Um, an undiagnosed new problem with uncertain prognosis. Um, an acute illness with systemic symptoms like um, colitis, um, pyelonephritis, an acute, acute complicated injury such as a head injury with brief loss of consciousness. Now we start moving into the high, and this is where we have a lot of issues is because you think about your, your high level E&M codes and you know that there's three areas of medical decision making. And you could have a higher diagnosis management option and type of data, which would make that a high complexity medical decision making. Um, but normally we see the type of data usually isn't at that high. I mean, obviously it's gonna depend on the patient. Um, the table of risk is a very, very important piece of the puzzle. And look at that high category, which I know, again, it's difficult to read, but these are life-threatening situations. Um, one or more chronic illnesses with severe exacerbation, progression, or side effects of treatment. Okay, this is where you hear trigger words. Okay, a severe exacerbation. Well, if we as a reviewer, auditor, as a coder, they can't determine whether it's severe or not, the documentation is just not very concise or clear, 
we're going to have to go with um, a, a mild exacerbation instead of the severe. So youth, if you feel they're having a severe exacerbation, document that they're having a severe exacerbation of whatever that may be, CHF, et cetera. That way there's no guessing involved. Someone will clearly know, they understand your thought process, you're stating that it is indeed severe. Uh, the next one is acute or chronic illnesses or injuries that pose a life threat to bodily um, function, such as like an MI, a PE. Again, these aren't, you know, these are severe situations. Um, life-threatening situations. And then you have an abrupt change in neurological status, such as a seizure, a TIA, weakness, or sensory loss. Um, again, needs to be very you know, clearly documented. Uh, just because somebody has cancer doesn't mean that they're gonna fall under that high for preventing problem. If it's a new patient, or if it's a new um, situation for you that you're ruling out CA, um, then yes, it could possibly be at, at that high level. But that patient who is, um, has CA and they're continuing to get their uh, chemotherapy, et cetera, uh, that's probably gonna be more at your moderate level, uh, not at your high. So again, very difficult to get your high. It is life-threatening situations. In a doctor's office, it's typically you're sending them over to the hospital to be seen. Um, or I've had the question before, well, I want them to go to the hospital, but they won't go. Well, obviously, even though they're not going to go to the hospital, you're going to clearly document um, that they will not proceed to the emergency room. Diagnostic procedures, you can see here the more invasive the procedure, the more risk that's involved. Um, when you start hearing words like risk factors, then you need to make sure you clearly identify those risk factors. Don't assume somebody's gonna look at that documentation and say, okay, well, they do have diabetes, they do have this. We need to see clearly or clearly identify what are those risk factors. Um, and, you know, typically those are comorbidities, so make sure that it's clearly defined, clearly documented for someone. Um, and that kind of trickles over into management options, too, because they use that terminology there for surgeries. And if you look at management options, um, some things I like to point out here. Uh, for low, you have IV fluids without additives, minor surgery with no identified risk factors, over-the-counter medications. Um, it doesn't matter if they're nursing home and you order Tylenol. It's still an over-the-counter medication. Moderate, you've got minor surgery with identified risk factors. So again, tr you know, trigger words, identified risk factors. Um, elective major surgery with no identified risk factors. Um, and people have asked me too, well, what's the definition of minor or major? Well, that's when you're gonna go out and you're gonna look to see the global days. Um, and that determines whether it's a minor or major. Prescription drug management, as I mentioned earlier, um, a decision to keep them on that same medication, same dosage, is still medical decision making. So you don't have to change um, that medication. Um, but it should be clearly documented that you are managing um, the medication. Um, IV fluids um, with additives. And then let's jump down to your high risk. So for high risk, you've got elective major surgery with identified risk factors, emergency major surgery, um, IVIM controlled substances, et cetera, those are listed under there. So you can see where this overall area for medical decision making, it's important to include orders. So if you're in the hospital or nursing home and re records are requested, provide those orders because we need to determine was it PO or was it IV? Because if it's IV, then it's considered high risk. Um, drug therapy requiring intensive monitoring for toxicity. This is another hot topic or area of a lot of questions. We did develop, and I'm going to show you here in a minute, the, minute, the title of the actual article. Um, we created an article that provides you with some examples of those type of drugs. Now, keep in mind, it's stating that it requires intensive monitoring for toxicity. So we expect to think, see things like labs. Um, things that are included on that are, are Coumadin, um, 
insulin IV. Um, heparin if it's given in the hospital setting. Um, vancomycin. Vancomycin, we would expect to see a peak in trough. Either you've ordered it or you have results back. So, I mean, obviously on that day you may not have results, so you'd have to show something like it was ordered, or um, if you, you know, maybe the day before you had the results. We need to see something to indicate that. Um, like chemo, you know, obviously with chemo you're going to be monitoring blood work, so we'd expect to see that indeed you're monitoring the blood work. Um, but we have this list to kind of aid you or help you with uh, determining those drugs. Um, and decision not to uh, resuscitate or to de-escalate care because of poor prognosis. Um, this isn't just because you need to go over a D DNR with a patient who was admitted to the nursing facility. This is in a situation where typically you're calling hospice in. They're, again, they have a poor prognosis. So make sure it's clearly documented um, within the documentation. And pretty much on slide 19 are things that we, we covered. Um, comorbidities, underlying diseases are the factors that increase the complexity of medical decision making, um, increasing the risk of complications, mortality. Morbidity and or mortality should be documented. Surgical or invasive diagnostic procedures ordered, planned, or scheduled at the time of the E&M e &M encounter should be documented. Surgical or invasive diagnostic procedures por performed at the time of the encounter should be documented to give the appropriate credit. And refer, referral for or a decision to perform a surgical or invasive procedure, diagnostic procedure on an urgent basis um, should be documented or implied. Um, I just mentioned a minute ago uh, the article for drugs requiring intensive monitoring. Um, and that is here on this slide. So if you go to the search field, there's two ways you can get to it, through the ENM Health Center, through our articles or through um, just in your search options, put in management options, drug therapy, and it should populate for you. So let's go over an example. This is just your table of risk. So remember I said the highest risk is the one that is the risk that's associated with that patient. So we've got a patient and under the assessment and plan it states, Hypertension stable, continue on lisinopril 10 milligrams, stable diet, controlled diabetes um, mellitus or mellitus 2, um, hemoglobin A1C 6.2. We look at the presenting problem. We've got moderate because we've got two or more stable problems. For diagnostic procedures, there's really nothing from this encounter to the next because remember we're looking at the risk right now. Management options, we've got moderate because we've got prescription drug management. And if you look at the guidelines, again, as I, said, I stated before, um, basically uh, in this situation it's going to be moderate because you, um, two of the three elements must be either met or exceeded. Well, in this situation we have two of them. We have the moderate, so it makes it moderate. Excuse me, I said that wrong. We take the highest risk. I apologize. We take, I'm jumping ahead of myself. We take the highest risk and, the, and moderate. So between the two is how you end up with your, your moderate. Um, only one of those were necessary to get to that moderate. I do want to jump back, though, for a minute because I do want to point something out that's really important here. Um, we're going to go back to our slide with the table of risk. And the table of risk, um, remember I was talking about presenting problem and it, it's from this encounter to the next. I like to give this example um, of chest pain. So let's talk about an ED per, um, situation where a patient presents with chest pain. And um, they basically ruled out that there's no MI. They think it's GERD and they sent the patient on, its, on their way. Well, that's not going to fall under a high category because GERD is not high. It's going to fall under a moderate risk. But let's take that same patient, and they're still concerned it might be an MI. They still have to do the further enzymes, et cetera. So they admit the patient to um, observation. Well, at that time, it's high and not moderate. So please keep those in mind. I, I just want to point that out, and I, I, I meant to do that earlier, so I apologize. But just think of that. Um, it, it tends to relate then to that final assessment and plan. So going back to this example, um, Let's 
and this is where I jumped ahead a minute ago, let's look at your overall decision making and let's determine what the overall decision making is. Now remember, two of the three elements must be either met or exceeded. Well, for our diagnosis management options, we've got two stable. Now remember, those are worth one point each. So that's why it's limited to. Type of data or data, there was the hemoglobin A1C that was reviewed and it was 6.2. So there's only one point there. Overall risk, remember we just did that a minute ago, we had moderate. Now here's where we have a split because we don't have two of the three elements at a higher, that are met or exceeded. So when you have a split, you take the one in the middle. So we have in this situation low complexity medical decision making. Now, again, our tool is going to do all the work for you. Obviously, again, you have to extract the documentation appropriately, plug that in, and when you hit the submit button, it's going to provide you with that overall medical decision making. Some common uh, E&M documentation coding errors that we see at Palmetto GBA is we're unable to determine if the diagnosis problem was stable or worsening under the, the diagnosis management options. Um, and so we may say it's stable because we can't clearly determine. And it, again, can affect that medical decision making. The assessment contained a list of diagnoses or problems that were not addressed or managed. Again, we cannot give credit, and obviously coding would not occur um, if it's not been addressed or um, managed. Documented labs reviewed without further information. Um, so simple statements like labs review or um, labs attached, um, you know, that's not acceptable. Um, we see a lot of the spine, the laboratory spines, that's appropriate, that's great, we can give the credit. Um, or again, I gave you those suggestions about you can even just attach an initial and signed lab report or um, diagnostic report. Um, and then it's always best to then refer to that, obviously. Unable to determine if the physician or NPP ind independently reviewed image tracing or specimen. I can't express that enough. Um, I always cringe when we, as, as in medical review, have to see that situation because we know it's we know that providers are independently reviewing those. Um, it's just not getting captured. Um, did not summarize old records or history from others, and I gave you the examples where we just see documentation attached or we just, you know, there's no question they say they reviewed it, but they're not doing the second portion of it, which is the summary. And as I've mentioned in all four of the webcasts, um, Number one, everybody should be performing in internal audits. Um, compliance is very, very important. Um, some people keep like a binder, some kind of uh, book to keep track of their audits um, so that you can indicate to someone that you did indeed, you are doing internal audits. Um, we find, you know, when I'm talking to providers that, um, you know, sometimes they find that they're overcoding, sometimes they find out they're undercoding. So it, it works both ways. Um, we highly recommend using our E&M audit tool, which is located on our website under the E&M Help Center. It's the first link under there. There's instructions that are included. Um, keep in mind, we understand that uh, there's all kinds of different tools out there. If you're using your own version, please make sure it's comparable to ours because you can see there's point systems um, that are utilized. And if your point system isn't the same as ours, which our reviewers are using, then you can come up with a different CPT code. So, um, you know, do that kind of check and balance. Make sure it's comparable um, to the one you're using. If not, we, we recommend you using ours. It's a, it's a nice tool for you to use. It's um, quick and easy. I mean, I, obviously at first it takes a little while to get used to, but you can complete that information, print that out, and keep that with your medical record or, or your booklet that you keep your information with. Um, use Palmetto GBA's uh, checklist. Um, we have a checklist that's also included with that E&M tool. So when you go to that link, that first link under the E&M Help Center, you're going to see a checklist tool too. So if records are requested, you can go through this checklist and just check off as you uh, retrieve the documentation. Designate certain staff to handle Medic Medicare audits. And I know I've made a joke in the past about, you know, don't just let your janitor, and I, I say that in all, you know, 
it is amazing because we work in the provider outreach and education department. It's amazing um, how many people um, just trust anyone to retrieve that documentation. People that aren't trained, that don't know the guidelines, they're not pulling the correct information or retrieving the correct information. They don't know where to re retrieve the information. So make sure that person is trained um, and understands the guidelines um, because we have encountered providers that have almost lost their practice because um, that, that individual wasn't responding to the request or they're not responding, providing the correct information. Um, we see it on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's very, very important. Attend educational events. We have ask the contractor teleconferences, um, web, webinars or webcasts. Um, the webcasts, um, as I mentioned earlier, they've been recorded the past three. Uh, we do have other additional ENM webcasts out there. Um, we, we, last year in um, around March and April, we, we broke down each of the different types of ENMs, like emergency department, nursing facility. So those are out there. They're located, again, under that self-paced learning. Um, I just want to remind you, though, if you go to that self-paced learning section, there are um, education, so there's links to recorded that are right down below. And those are things that are greater than 90 days. Those are converted over to YouTube. Anything that's recent, so less than 90 days, are going to be under the library. So you'll see a link within the, the article. There will be a link that has the webcast library. And those are anything that's less than 90 days. When you do anything less than 90 days, um, typically then you can print out the PowerPoint and you can receive uh, the certificate for attendance. Um, anything over 90 days, um, from my understanding, we, um, currently you're, you don't have access to that. Please initiate contact, ask for help, we're here for you, um, that's what our team's for, so please reach out and um, we have forms on our websites um, if you, you need additional one-on-one uh, -on -one help. As I mentioned at the beginning, we always provide you with important resources. They've been the same throughout the ENM webcast and basically the internet only manual, uh, that's a lifeline that's kind of the Bible um, for Medicare. You have 100-04, especially Chapter 12, goes in a lot about E&M, teaching guidelines, prolonged care, critical care, um, chemotherapy, modifier 25. I could, I could just name, continue to name tons of different things that are there. 100-08, especially Chapter 3, that is uh, the program integrity manual that talks about signatures and um, medical review. And then you have the link for the signature articles, the signature, uh, excuse me, MLN Matters article. And then our Palmetto GBA website for J11 and then the railroad. And we have the modifier lookup tool, great, great tool. Um, FAQs, the e and Help Center um, is important if you're obviously billing e and codes. We wanted to capture everything and keep it housed like in a great area for you that you could quickly go, find those answers. So under your e and Help Center, you've got frequently asked questions, you've got articles, you've got a medical review section that talks about uh, medical review, e and weekly tips, so all kinds of great resources for you um, because as you all know, there's a lot of great areas, so we try to capture those in articles and FAQs. And then uh, CMS has published um, the e &M guidelines, again, that we use. Um, however, again, there are those gray areas, so we had to take those and interpret those um, gray or define those gray areas. Um, but you can find those located um, at this link. So uh, the CMS is also, if you go to the e &M Help Center and you go to articles, at the top of that is a link so that you um, can go directly to that. But when I was talking about um, the table of risk, that is located under that first bullet, Evaluation and Management Services Guide. So that's where you would find that. Um, I'm going to open um, this up to questions and answers right now. Um, as I'm compiling those, I do want to remind everybody if they could uh, number one, please take uh, the survey. Uh, we use this to plan our future education, et cetera. Uh, so it's very, very important. And you'll see that located down under one of your widgets, your survey widget. So if you could please take that. 
Also, um, the Palmetto, GB, Palmetto GBA course number is 827-568. Again, that's 827-568. So um, at this time, I'm going to go through um, the questions that we have. And bear with me because we do have quite a bit and I need to um, see what we have here. For hospital visits 99231 through 99233, how much weight does Palmetto GBA give the CPT statements? Usually the patient is stable recovering. If a visit meets two of the three for 99223, but the cancer renal failure is stable, does Palmetto GBA see that as a 99231? Well, that statement that's taken from the AMA or from the, from the CPT code books is just that. It's, it's typically. Um, we're going to use the score sheet tool and we're going to determine if indeed it does meet the requirements. If it meets the two out of the three, 99233, um, again, it may have been warranted that they needed to do more of an extensive, um, well, number one, let me take that back. Let me say this. If, if all the issue is, so is the cancer and renal failure, obviously that enough is not gonna make a medical decision making um, and it's stable, is probably not gonna warrant um, high medical decision making in itself. Now there's et cetera on there. So yes, indeed, if there was more diagnoses or problems that were being, being addressed, it could meet high, even with stable problems, because they could be dealing with something under the table of risk that is, um, you know, for example, drugs, drugs in requiring intensive monitoring. So between that and the number of the diagnosis and management options could equal a high, high risk. So therefore, yes, it's nice guidance under the, the, the coding books, but ultimately um, we, we kind of have to go by our score sheets and be consistent. And um, so therefore, you, you may still have a 99233. Now obviously, again, we're going to look at um, the whole picture. So we're going to look at, was there over-documentation of the history of examination, and what was that medical decision making? Because 99233 is, correlates with high medical decision making. You know, obviously, if it, it, it scores out to something like moderate or um, lower, um, then we're going to look again at that, that exam and that, that history to determine, did it really warrant that? Um, but yes, most certainly, it could still, even though the, the definition is usually, um, and I think that's the key, is they give these scenarios, and that is a typical or usual situation, but it's not always the situation. Can you use diagnosis, diagnoses in the HPI that are not listed in the, a, um, the assessment and plan part of the progress note? Um, yes, you may. However, I would want, if, for that individual, so if you were the coder or if you were the compliance, I would educate that, provi uh, that provider. It really should be down under the assessment, but we will look at the overall. Um, documentation. So maybe the, the provider forgot to document that under the assessment and plan. So yes, we could still consider it, act, you know, obviously education needs to occur that it should be brought down and used under that um, assessment. A minor cut is a minor problem, but if it's new, will it be counted as one point or three point? Well, that is considered a minor, and if you look at, and I'm, I'm, I know it'd be easier if I would go back to that screen, but it may get a little bit more complicated. But if you look under that, that self-limited or minor stable, so slide 10, self-limited or minor stable improving or worsening, that's where it would go. It wouldn't at that point matter that if it's new or established. Um, so 
we would count that still under the minor. If the provider reads the records from a previous admission and summarizes, will they count for two points with an EHR? Um, so far, we're still allowing that um, because it's still going back into the medical record um, and it's from a previous admission. Again, though, I would make sure that you provide a summary um, and you know give those give those results because if not, um, you can't just say that you you're reviewing it. Can you expand upon uh, slide number 10, new problem with additional workup? I notice consultation is listed there now. What does Palmetto GBA ex expect to see documented in this case? Well, consultation's always been there. The only thing is, um, when they say consultation, obviously we don't recognize consultation code, but you're still, you're, people are still consulting. We just use different verbiage now. We are using like initial hospital codes, et cetera but they're still consulting. So if they need somebody else's opinion or advice, et cetera, referrals, those need to be documented because it's telling us for credit there that you need somebody to evaluate that patient to determine what's going on. So um, that slide following, or I shouldn't say it's following, um, slide 12, providers should document Referral consultation advice requested, so it should indicate to whom or where. So maybe it just simply states consult uh, GI for possible GERD. Well, we, we know then we have a new problem with additional workup planned. Um, so don't think of consultation in the terminology of coding. Look at it as a consultation as in they needed somebody's expertise or advice um, to assist them with, with this patient. Again, bear with me, I'm going through um, quite a bit here. If the physician and patient have decided to proceed with their surgery and the physician orders a cardiac clearance and CAD is listed in the final assessment, would this meet the identified risk factors for surgery? Well, in this situation, um, we can't just assume. So therefore, we tell providers to be very clear and concise. If you feel that there's identified risk factors, is to simply state that they have identified risk factors and what those consist of. Here's a really good question. What if the split leaves a space in the decision? So, for example, so everybody may want to look at um, the overall medical decision making. So if you're looking at that and if you see a split, so for example, diagnosis management options was two, which is equal to limited, data was one, and risk was four. Now notice nothing was in moderate we take the one in the middle still. So even though you had high risk, you get low complexity medical decision making because you take the one in the middle, not the one, there was nothing in moderate. So really because of the uh, diagnosis management options being limited of two, that's what made that a low. I hope that makes sense. Again, bear with me, I'm just going through, there's quite a bit here. If the patient is in the emergency department with chest pain and a final diagnosis is GERD, but they give an injection of morphine, would you still consider high risk? Yes, we would. 
um, because we're taking the overall risk. And because they gave um, that injection, that did make it, make it high risk. So you are correct. Someone asked, how am I supposed to score with the EM tool if I have been consulted for an inpatient who is in the swing bed? This is for Part B. From my understanding, and I, I'd have to go back out and read the guidelines, I, I'm going to direct you to the manual that I was talking about, that 100-04, Chapter 12. From my understanding, they talk about swing beds in there. So put a search in for swing beds. They talk about, I think it determines what the place of service is. So if it's still considered inpatient, it's going to depend on that situation. Um, sometimes they're considered nursing facilities. So it depends on that place of service, wherever that, whatever that would be considered. So you'd need, number one, you've got to check with your facility, find out what place of service they're billing, and then the CPT codes then obviously would follow whatever place of service that may be. But it's in that 100-04, Chapter 12, they talk about swing beds. Now, I'm getting some questions where they're giving me like an overall kind of situation. Like here's one GI patient with ulcerative colitis, bleeding, diarrhea, abdominal pain, orders lab, colon, could this not be a level five? Well, I mean, there's still other two components of the E&M service. If you're talking about medical decision-making portion of it, it's going to depend. Is it a new problem? Um, I mean, obviously the risk would be high. Um, but it's going to depend on, because there's not much to go by here. I'm assuming maybe it's a new problem, ulcerative colitis with bleeding, diarrhea, abdominal pain. Um, it, it could possibly be a five, but, again, you're, you're not going to probably, if, if you feel that you need to deal with this within, in your office setting and they're not going over to the hospital be, to be evaluated, then no, it probably will not be a five. It's going to be more of a four. Um, but not only that, you got to think of the other two components. So, and that's what happens a lot of times with medical decision making and dealing um, and talking with providers. You know, people want to skip to okay, the medical decision making, and well, if they present with this, this, and this, it's always this code, et cetera. Well, it's not always that because there are three areas of med three areas of an E&M code. So, yes, you may have beautiful documentation for your medical decision making and you are doing that work, but if you fail to meet the components for your history examination that's required, then it's still not going to meet that level. Sometimes management options do not match the nature of the presenting problem in cases where a prescription is given for a low severity problem. How does Medicare address that? Well, we still look over the, you know, we have to follow the guidelines and they state whichever is the highest. So prescription drug management is going to fall under mo moderate, even though you may have low for presenting problem. We are still required because you are, or that provider's um, performing, a I should say performing, monitoring a prescription drug, then they, they then will get the credit for the moderate risk for that section. Some really good questions. And again, bear with me because there's so many I'm trying to, to weed through these. Um, the next question is, if initially a patient's diagnosis was pain, and then at the follow-up visit the test results show a definitive diagnosis of like an ACL tear, would this be counted as a new problem or established worsening, et cetera? We typically will count that as a new problem, um, that they had the pain, um, there was no definitive answer, and then we would give them credit um, because they may need to do additional testing um, with that ACL tear or a consultation may be re requested. Um, so at that point, we typically will give it a new problem and then depending on additional workup or not.
here's uh, to find the overall established ENM code, which two sections are the most important to find the correct code? Example, HPI and medical decision making. Well, in the guidelines, um, for a new patient, for example, or like an initial hospital emergency department, you have to have three out of the three key components and they have to be at the same level. So therefore, they're all three important. Um, the established patient, et cetera, where you only need two out of the three key components, and a lot of people don't realize this, and I really didn't get into this, is that that definition for us is you still don't have to have, like for example, if you don't feel an examination is warranted, you may just have a history and an exam, uh, history and a medical decision making. Um, again, that's interpretation. Some people interpret it, you still have to have all three, but in our eyes, you only have to have two out of the three. So whether that's history and examination, um, we always have to have the medical decision making pretty much because that's what's going to lead medical necessity. Um, so you may have a stronger history um, and not so much in your exam, vice versa. So it depends on the patient and what's going on with that patient. So we can't just simply say it's the history or and the medical decision making. I can tell you this, medical, uh, medical decision making is typically always there because it's going to drive the medical necessity, um, the reason for that encounter. And as I mentioned, medical... As I'm saying, medical necessity is going to steer that ENM code. Um, so established patients, et cetera, that is up to the physician and what is medically necessary for that encounter, whether it be a stronger history, um, maybe they don't feel they need an examination, or maybe they feel they need an examination but their history is lacking. Um, that is all, again, determined by the physician and those presenting problems, et cetera. Please reiterate the comment regarding document, documenting coding errors. The assessment contained a list of diagnosis problems that were not addressed or managed. Um, this is where we see like these problem lists and, or, or just lists in general that they may have these problems, but they're not being addressed on that, in, that visitor encounter. Well, that's not, that is not something that should be coded or billed for that day, and that e &M shouldn't be based on that, those, those diagnosis codes or problems. Um, and we see it a lot with the EMR, where we have problem lists, and they're carried over and carried over. Excuse me, but what really is being addressed on that day is maybe two of those problems and not the remaining problems. So it's whatever is being addressed on that day. And we also see a lot of history of, like a history of MI um, or other histories that has nothing even relevant to that situation. And any histories should be part of the uh, history component. So that's where we're seeing issues. Some providers will just list everything or even list diagnoses of problems that they're not even addressing. I mean, somebody else may be managing or addressing. Um, if indeed they're managing or addressing, and that, that's tricky because if you think about like your hospitalist and your internal medicine, well, a lot of those are the gatekeepers. So they may be kind of overlapping with some of the specialists. Um, but specialists, let's talk about specialists, a lot of times those aren't overlapping and they'll list every diagnosis imaginable um, and it really is about whatever they're managing or um, treating uh, that, that encounter. So if the patient presents with a new problem like an upper respiratory infection and physician decides to treat cough with a prescription such as Teflon pearls, will this still be considered a moderate complexity? Technically, yes, because you've got your upper respiratory infection, which is a new problem, um, no additional workup plan, which is three, and then you have prescription drug management, which is your Teflon pearls. Um, and this is where, you know, I think it overlaps with do you feel comfortable billing um, that moderate medical decision making? Um, for consistency, you know, really you need to come up with, yes, we're going to follow that. Some people say, no, we're going to go back to 
the coding book and say that's typically not the situation, let's say, for a level four office visit. But in our scoring guidelines and in our rules, we would accept that as a moderate medical decision making. Did I understand correctly that the risk of the presenting problem would be the risk from the end of this, this visit until the next encounter? Um, as opposed to the risk from the beginning of the visit until the next encounter, that is correct. Um, because it is, in the guidelines it states, it's from that encounter into the next encounter. Um, again, somebody can present some, with certain symptoms that could appear to be anything. Life-threatening, and I gave the example of the chest pain. Um, they could be life-threatening situations or they could not be life-threatening situa situations. So therefore, that risk for that patient is not the same um, for those, you know, if it's a non-life-threatening or, you know, that severity isn't there. So that's where that assessment and plan really, and that's why it's important for them to use things like probable and uh, they paint the picture to describe what's going on so that somebody can determine, you know, what is their thought process? What are they thinking? Um, you know, I'll use this example. Somebody comes in with shortness of breath. Yes, they have a history of CHF, but they're ruling out, you know, pneumonia versus, you know, a severe exacerbation of CHF. You know, um, you, you have to look at that overall ending result. What are they thinking it is? You know, obviously, if they're sending them home for presenting problem, that is. I'm not talking about diagnostic management or um, the, the, the um, management options. I'm talking strictly about presenting problem. You have to look at it as if they're going to be sending them home, like from the ED, it is not going to be high. Um, and, and that's where I go back to, like, the chest pain again. They presented, I had chest pain. Yes, they're going to evaluate me. I have signs and symptoms of an MI. They're going to rule out that. They did indeed rule it out. They're sending me home because I've GERD. Well, at that point, that risk to that patient is not the same as if they had an MI or possibly have an MI at, at that point. Um, so, yes. Very good questions here. And somebody just kind of asked that same question. They said, um, you know, even though they're still doing enzymes, EKGs, et cetera, well, if they ruled it out, they're not having the – and remember, I used GERD as in they sent them home and they said it was GERD then yes, indeed, it is not, it's moderate, it's not high. But if that same patient needs to stay, they need to be admitted to ops and they need to have continue with the enzymes, they probably already had an EKG done at that point, um, then, then yes, that would be a high risk because they're still trying to rule out an MI. MI. But the one I just spoke about with the GERD, they've already made a decision. They sent them home. Um, so it clear it just basically falls down to the comes down to the documentation and what is documented under that assessment and plan and that's again where we really need to see that thought process. What determines medical necessity, nature of the presenting problem or management options? Um, Basically, again, I think this is going along with the same question that was just posed. Um, if you're talking about the table of risk, because you, you used, um, well, I, I'm not sure exactly what is, how this is correlating, if it's correlating with the table of risk or if you're, if you're just stating the overall medical necessity. Um, and I don't know, I think this was the same individual that asked about um, the Tesla and Pearls, um, which determines medical center nature, the presenting problem, or the management options? Um, well, obviously, you still have to look at the nature of the presenting problem, but overall, um, if you're talking about management options with that Tesla and Pearls, um, that is consider, considered moderate risk. So, therefore, that does fall in line with like a 99214. I know it is a fine line. And that's where these score sheets, um, they're good, but yet you have to worry about medical necessity. But honestly, for consistency, you really need to kind of stick with the score sheets unless it's blatant. 
um, then you know then that's where there can be issues with that, the tool sheet. So somebody asked if, and I'm assuming they're talking about an yeah, established patient, if the medical decision making meets high, which is in line with the 99215, but the examination is low, what does that, what, what does that meet? Um, I'm assuming there's probably a chief complaint there. Um, and then um, that would be a 99213. Now, our tool will do all the work for you, but um, in that situation, it would actually be a 99213 um, because we have no history. You're mentioning there's no documentation of any history. Again, I'm sure there's a chief complaint. Um, and then low, excuse me, expanded problem. I shouldn't say it shouldn't be low. Um, examination can only be um, problem-focused, expanded problem-focused, detailed, or comprehensive. I'm going to assume assume you mean an expanded problem focused, and then high medical decision making. Well, in that situation, you have a 99213. If a patient is scheduled for surgery for a treatment of a problem, not a diagnostic, is this considered additional workup? No. We wouldn't consider any kind of treatment of a problem, like they had to have appendicitis, uh, appendectomy. That wouldn't be considered. But things that are diagnostic in nature, like biopsies, colonoscopies, et cetera, those would be things that would be additional workup. They need those results um, to determine or initiate a treatment plan or determine what's going on with that patient. New problem with additional workup is ordering x-rays considered additional workup. Yes, it is, even if you get the results back that day. I'm getting very close to my time cutoff. Um, I'm going to take a, probably a few more, um, but before I do, I just want to, again, remind everybody to please, please, please take the, um, the evaluation and um, also to remind everybody that the um, course code is 827568. And again, bear with me, I'm looking through some of these questions. Um, under medical decision making, what management option would you uh, suggest for radiation therapy? Um, this could go under your um, your high category. Sorry, I'm trying to find my table of risk here that I've misplaced. So, um, yes, it would go under your high category. Now, obviously, your presenting problem maybe even though they have like CA, it's not going to be um, at that high level, but. You, um, you could um, count that under the high category for a radiation therapy. Again, bear with me. I'm going to look through some more examples. As an um, ophthalmologist, we manage patients with diabetic retinopathy. If we ask patients their last hemoglobin A1C and record this in the chart, can this be counted as a review of a test that the patient knows the value? We do not review the actual lab or talk with, to the MD. Um, I would not include that. That's more subjective. Include that under um, more of the history component, but not under the type of data. If the doctor orders a CT, a CAT scan, and the result is not on the same day, is it considered high complexity? Well, 
I'm not sure I follow the question, to be honest with you. Um, there's three areas of medical decision making. Um, so it would, it would determine on, is it a new problem with additional workup? Um, and then what are they trying to rule out or what are they looking for? Um, so there's different factors. You can't just simply say just because they ordered a CAT scan, um, is it considered high complexity? Um, now, if you want to talk about diagnosis management options and whether it's a new problem with additional workup, then yes, it would be, even if they, have, they don't have the results on the same day. Um, but if you're talking about overall medical decision making, there's, there's more information that would need to be um, provided in order to, to determine that. And actually, I think here's one. This will be my last one because of time. Um, did you just say that sending a patient to surgery is not considered, considered additional workup? That is correct. The only time a surgery is additional workup for us is if it is things like a biopsy, colonoscopy, um, but not for a surgery. Um, nothing where, again, I use the example of an appendectomy. Um, that's not additional workup. That, they don't need that information. Um, that, that is actually, they have a plan. They're going to send them to have their appendix removed. Even though they may not be quite sure it's the appendix, they're still sending them for an appendectomy. So um, we at that, that would not consider that additional workup. And again, I want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, we had a lot of great questions, and I know medical decision making um, can be very overwhelming. I think it's the toughest part of the E&M service. Um, so again, thank you. I hope everybody's had an opportunity to be involved with the um, webcast. If not, again, we have those recorded um, on our website. And again, um, please take a minute um, and take that evalu or complete that evaluation. And again, our um, code for today is 827-568. Thank you and have a great day.